our distinguished guest today, Dr. Baruti Kemti Sitavong, who is the director with his wife of the Transcendental Meditation Center in Cambridge. And I want to start by saying I know there's some skeptics in the audience and others who are just curious and don't know anything about TM. And I was going to explain a little bit about why I think this is such an important topic for us to talk about today. So the four pillars of wellness that we've been hosting webinars about, uh, eating healthy, staying active, reducing stress, and sleep. We've spent a lot of time on eating healthy and staying active and a little less on stress and sleep, but every single one of us, especially with the pandemic, but just with life, is dealing with stress, anxiety, and things that are beyond our control. And so everyone has different ways of dealing with that. And with my patients, I know that the last out of the last five patients I saw, three of them meditate regularly. And in fact, I got really interested in TM because one of my patients last year, who's a very successful businessman, describes himself as very type A, flies all over the world, very high pressure job, told me that TM really changed his life. And he told me about a book called Strength in Stillness by Bob Roth, which I subsequently listened to on, on my walk. And I became really interested in how TM in particular and meditation in general can really help our patients not just with managing day-to-day -day stress, but how that carries over into managing blood pressure, heart disease, atrial fibrillation, insomnia, et cetera. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Sisevong here today. And I'll just, full disclosure, he's not quite got his PhD yet, but he's 99% of the way there. So I consider that enough to call him doctor. Um, before we get started, and he's got a fabulous backstory and also a lot of science and information about TM, I just want to take a little poll, and we haven't done this before, so forgive me, but if you can see this poll, uh, it says, have you ever tried meditation? And you just click on whether you've never tried it or you did in the past, but not anymore. You meditate once in a while or meditate regularly. So take a moment and click on this poll. And I just want to get a sense of where our audience is coming from in terms of meditation. So I'm going to give it a few more seconds. Okay, let's take a look and see. So there's no right or wrong answer, obviously, but I can see about a third of you meditate occasionally, and about a third of you have meditated in the past. And so we've got about 65 people in the audience here, and some people who've never tried it. So that's super fun. I'm going to show those results to everybody. So that's awesome. And I've got one more poll here. And I want to ask you, let's see if we can do this. The second poll is, hmm, Sydney, can you launch the second poll? It doesn't seem to want to launch for me. The second one is just to get your, um, your uh, reason for being here and whether you're here hoping to have some help with your own personal medical problems. So what are you most hoping to gain from today's session? So whether you're just curious or you're really struggling with insomnia, high blood pressure, anxiety, depression, multiple of the above. So we'll give this a few more seconds here too. So thanks all for participating in this poll. We'll give it another five seconds. Okay. All right, and um, you've got it. Okay. Perfect. All right, so good. So a lot of you have multiple concerns, and then there's sort of an even uh, distribution of insomnia, high blood pressure, anxiety, depression, and curiosity. So this is perfect. So with that, Dr. Baruti, the floor is yours. Well, uh, Dr. Lewis, thank you for the invitation. I, I've often thinking about when you uh, contacted me to speak to the group and you shared with me the history of the Lounge Group. And as you were sharing with me the history, I immediately said, I'm in. Primarily because of the holistic approach that the group takes to the matter of wellness. You know, eating healthy, staying active, reducing stress and sleep are so important. I look at those as the pillars of our both internal and external wellness. And eating healthy, I, I've had the chance to, now the third time, 
I had a chance to read through Dr. T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study, which as you know, is the largest epidemiological study ever conducted on humankind. And myself being a plant-based person since undergrad, I graduated the first time in 1998, being plant-based and encountering a, a cardiology group that is suggesting to their patients to do something similar in terms of eating healthy is really important. Couple that with the fact of heart health. We do know that in terms of health, you know, you have the anaerobic and the aerobic function. The aerobic function is the heart, anaerobic is the muscle. And so- Sorry, the just, main, Tucker, just a little tiny bit louder if you don't mind. Anaerobic is of course uh, the heart. I mean, aerobic is the heart, anaerobic is uh, the, are the muscles. And so remaining healthy is really important, not just for the short term of our life, but the long term. Because as we age, as we mature, we, we lose it if we don't use it. And so staying healthy is really important in terms of remaining active. Reducing stress. We live in an epidemic of stress. I didn't know the degree to which people are stressed in society until my wife and I began teaching Transcendental Meditation in 2013 when we were moved here. And we didn't know about Adderall and Vyvanse and things that people take to manage and mitigate stress in their lives and to maintain a level of focus in their chosen professions. So for me, that was really important to get into delving into what it is that you guys do and sleep. Uh, sleep is paramount. And this is what TM comes to be really effective because when you experience the transcending, that settledness within the meditation itself, it is akin to stage four sleep, which is the deepest part of sleep. So when you fall asleep at night, you get a chance to undergo that process of structured forgetting. The brain reduces those connections that are not meant to have a long-term impact, whereas it strengthens those connections that are. You get a quality amount of sleep. When you practice TM, a similar process occurs within the brain itself. So it's the interface between the brain, between the inner world and the outer world is the brain itself. And so this is an opportunity. And I was so excited when you, when you approached me because again, what it is that you guys do is phenomenal. It has to be done. It is pushing the envelope, so to speak, when it relates to healthcare and people's approach to their own health and wellness. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll add that I have signed up to take this course in April, um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, we're looking forward to working with you for sure, my wife and I, definitely, definitely. Transcendental meditation is a very old technique. It's, we're talking thousands upon thousands of years old. It comes from the Vedic tradition out of India. And in 1958, Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, who's the founder of what is classified as the Transcendental Meditation Organization or Maharshi Foundation, he sought to really help people live better lives. If you have any understanding of history, you know that at that time, you were 13 years after World War II, really working to rebuild society. Then you move into the 60s and 70s, and there was a tremendous amount of social angst. And so when you think about what was happening in society at the time, Maharshi was simply responding to the needs of the time to help people live better lives. And essentially that's to be less stressed. If I'm less stressed, I'm clear. And in being clear, I make better decisions. I often say to people that we make our worst decisions when we lack clarity, yet our best decisions when we have clarity. TM is this age old technique that affords that process to really become the, the basis of your very being in life. And so the four areas of efficacy are as follows, mental potential, health, social behavior, and the impact on the larger social world. So when you think about that, that structure, mental potential is your mind, health is your body, social behavior is how you are in the world, the impact on a larger social world is the imprint you leave on the world itself. Mental potential is just what it sounds like. Your mind becomes clear. Why? Because you're transcending all the stuff that goes on within your mind. Thoughts associated with prior experiences, going back to what I said before in terms of structured forgetting. When you sit to practice transcendental meditation morning and afternoon, you're transcending. You're going beyond the active level of the mind, going beyond the thoughts that populate your mind to experience that deep well of silence that is resident within everyone. It isn't just within some people, it is within everyone. Everyone who can hear what it is that I'm saying, agree or disagree with what it is that I'm saying, choose to or not to act what it is that I'm saying. And at the very least are the age of 10 because of brain maturation can practice transcendental meditation. What you're doing is allowing your mind to settle. How does this happen? It's a mantra. Mantra is a vehicle that moves the attention in an inward direction. Mantra is a Sanskrit word that simply means a sound whose effects are known. So this mantra is chosen for you as you come through to learn the technique itself. There's an interview process 
this helps us to decide the best mantra for you. Now, some may be wondering how many mantras are there. I will say there are more than there are blood types, but they're less than 100. And so there's a series of mantras that we select from that we've been trained, my wife and I, and all team teachers for that matter, have been trained to understand the best effects for you in terms of the mantra. That mantra is then presented to you. But it's not the mantra alone, it's also the technique itself that allows the mind to settle. The mind is designed to settle. Just as a light is designed to be both on and off, so too is the mind designed to be both active and at rest. This mantra moves the attention in an inward direction, allows you to settle. And in allowing you to settle, you experience what is classified scientifically as restful alertness. In your brainwave patterns from EEG, this is alpha one. Alpha is associated with cortical idling. Alpha one is associated with restful alertness. It's eight to 10 hertz per second. You sit in to practice the technique and you settle within the meditation itself. You experience this very settled, very relaxed moment, series of moments within the meditation. You come out of that meditation. You bring more calmness and clarity with you into your day. Why? Because you've gone beyond all the stuff that's going on within your mind. I often say to people that we make our best decisions when we have that clarity and our worst decisions when we lack the clarity. The lacking of clarity comes because we constantly play over the prior experiences in our lives that were problematic, whether it be an interaction with someone out in the street, whether it be something from when we were a childhood, in our, in our childhood, whether it be something from when, you, when we were in university, we're constantly playing these things over in our head. And what we're doing in truth, to get into neuroscience here, you're strengthening the connections within your brain associated with those experiences. It's going to inform your default thinking and default actions. I often say the only way we become good at anything is because of practice. Anders Ericsson in his book, Peak, The Secrets of the New Science of Expertise refers to it as deliberate practice. So you can become proficient in anything. And yes, you can become a proficient warrior as well. So as you <laughs> ruminate over those prior experiences, you're strengthening those connections. And we're doing it innocently. We just don't know that we're doing it. But once we become aware of it, the question then becomes, what do we do about it? With transcendental meditation, you're transcending those thoughts associated with those experiences. Again, remember, you can only have an experience one time. Now, the next time you recall that experience, you call it again, you recall it again. In truth, you're recalling the last time you had the thought about the experience and not the experience itself. And along the way, for want of a better word, you've colored that experience. You've made it, as my dad used to say, make a mountain out of a molehill. So basically what you're doing is you're making it worse. You strengthen those connections and that's going to inform your default way of being within the world. What you're doing with transcendental meditation is to go beyond that. Transcending simply means to go beyond. You're going beyond the active level, going beyond the thoughts to experience that quietude. And it's an experience in that quietude that you settle. Now, the mind and body are intimately connected. Your mind settles, your body is going to correspondingly settle. One of the best examples I give of this would be that of cortisol within the physiology. We know cortisol is a stress hormone secreted by the adrenals, the adrenals sit atop the kidneys. But we notice also too that the amygdala or the primitive brain, if it's in constant fight or flight mode, it's impacting your adrenals. And in impacting those adrenals, that excess cortisol is being secreted into the system. Now, when you sit to practice transcendental meditation, what you're doing is giving your amygdala an opportunity to rest. Research has shown repeatedly that your blood can be drawn pre and post practicing TM. And on average, the cortisol levels are 30% less. That's a marked difference when you really stop and think about it. And often we wonder, well, how is this possible? Well, it stands to reason that if the mind settles, the body's going to settle. I often give in my talks the example of a person on a Friday afternoon, I come to their office and I ask them, I want to see you Monday morning at 7.30 a.m. It's 3.15 on a Friday. And I ask you, what are you going to do for the entire weekend? You'll be thinking about what is this meeting going to cover? Where did I go wrong in my daily <laughs> reports? What did I do that I could have done better? You're going to roommate over the entire weekend. You'll be up bright and early, stressed though you may be Monday morning, you will be there at the appointed time. And it may turn out to be much better than what you thought it was going to be. Could be worse, but who knows, it may be better. What Transcendental Meditation gives you an opportunity to do is in transcending all the thoughts associated with, you create a new baseline. Doesn't mean you'll never become annoyed with anything, but it means you return to your baseline much more quickly. You settle, you don't hold on to things for very long. And, and, and in not holding on to things for very long, you find you bring with you in your day a level of equanimity. You bring that calmness and that clarity. 
and it's going to impact your physiology. We know, for example, that not only do cortisol levels decrease, again, on average 30%, we know the high blood pressure numbers decrease. This is established research and data. I think about 390 peer-reviewed studies on TM now. You've got a decrease in heart rate in terms of when you practice transcendental meditation, your blood pressure decreases, high blood pressure. Low blood pressure normalizes. We find that people who have significant you know, palpitations in the heart begin to settle, they become less anxious. Remember, if you're anxious about something, it's going to impact your physiology. Your heart is racing because you're in a meeting. You're, you're afraid of what it is that you're going to say or you want to say the wrong thing. Having a level of equanimity impacts the physiology. And as a result of that, you find yourself walking into your day with calmness first within that can then be made manifest without. This is getting into the third area in terms of efficacy, that of social behavior. If a person no longer has to be concerned about lacking in mental clarity, if they have health concerns that can be addressed by getting proper amounts of rest, great sleep at night, uh, a bit of activity, eating, of course, the proper amounts of food and having the, the mental stability, interior stability to, to follow the recommendations of the physicians such as yourselves, you find these are gains that are being created over time. And as you consistently engage in the technique and the practices that are put forth as a holistic aspect of your own wellness, you find you walk into your day in terms of social behavior with none of the prior concerns you had before. No longer anxious about engaging in interactions. Health concerns begin to abate because you get proper amounts of rest. You find yourself becoming much more centered. One of my favorite quotes comes from Benjamin Elijah Mays, a past president of Morehouse College in Atlanta. He says, the circumference of life cannot be rightly drawn until the center is set. The circumference of life cannot be rightly drawn until the center is set. I love that because he didn't say the circumference of life, i.e. the things of life, the, the, the accoutrement of life, they, they couldn't be acquired, they couldn't be had. But when you have your center, your core, those things mean less and mean more simultaneously because you're actively engaged in the process of what it is you want to participate in. You're not allowing yourself to bold over by social circumstances, you are aware of them, yet less and less impacted by them because you have this centeredness that you carry with you into your day. People around you will feel that centeredness. They know that there's something different about you because you're walking into this meeting with more calmness and clarity than you heretofore have had. That's going to impact the world around you. How you inter in in interact with people, engage people in a conversation, it's going to be felt by them. Why? Because it's within you. When you cultivate that calmness and clarity, you bring that with you into your day to greater and greater effect. It's impacting the world around you. I often say to people that those with whom you come into contact, they may never remember your name, but they will always remember how you make them feel. Did you make them feel welcomed? Did you make them feel seen and heard? Did you make them feel less than because of something going on within you? As you go beyond all of those things that are happening within you to experience that calmness and that clarity, that becomes your, for one of a better way of saying it, your calling card. That becomes who and what you are at your core being made manifest. Calmness, clarity, equanimity, better health, mental and physical, but also to socially from an emotional perspective as well. Any points of reflection on that? Yeah, no, that's so, it's so beautiful. Cause I, one thing that Bob Roth talks about is that if you imagine yourself being a little boat on the choppy ocean and we're always trying to calm the ocean and that is a fruitless endeavor. Never, absolutely. But TM is more of go below that surface of that absolutely. choppy water and find the stillness, which always exists at the bottom of the ocean. Exactly. Go down to that quiet place. And that's sort of what you're talking about is that your brain has this tumultuous external you know things flying at us all the time and we can't control that right all we can control is how we are in our own brain and our own body absolutely i think it was gutta he says uh, talent develops in quiet places character in the full stream of human life and so what you're doing with tm is you're cultivating this calmness and this character within yourself you're doing it quietly in your home twice a day morning and afternoon for 20 minutes you sit quietly to practice the technique and all the stuff that's going on, the tumultuous aspect of our daily lives, we transcend it. 
I often say that the first word in the word meditation is me. I get an opportunity twice a day to make this about me. For far too many of us, it is the only time per day that we get a chance to do something for ourselves. So when you said to make this about you, to commit to the practice, I often say, have this infinite rigidity that I'm going to practice twice per day, yet simultaneously this infinite flexibility as to how that's meted out, meaning if it's before or after your morning ablutions, if it's when you get to your office and you're seated in your vehicle, if you have a long commute and your driver is commuting, making, you, making his way or her way through traffic and you're sitting in the back of the vehicle and you're meditating, make that time about you. Because what's going to happen, you're going to transcend all the stuff that's going on here. You experience the calmness and clarity. And part of those tumultuous moments may be problems. And in that meditation, in that silence that's resident within you, solutions rest. And it's in getting out of the way and staying out of the way those solutions can easily surface. And as they easily surface, you act on them, even in the moment. I often say to people, we go from within a moment, speaking of tumultuous moments, you have this moment of stress. You have this stimulus and reaction, which is our normal, for far too many of us, way of being. We go from stimulus and reaction to that of stimulus and response when you regularly practice TM. This is happening because that, that, that calmness that Bob talks about that's resonant within everyone, you experience it and you bring it with you into your day. So much so that in that moment, in the midst of this chaotic moment, there's a momentary pause. And within that pause, the best solution will surface. You act on that information as it surfaces, you produce a positive outcome. And in so doing, over time and with repetition of a similar experience, you create your confidence and your ability to get out of the way, stay out of the way, produce positive outcomes, not just for yourself, but also too for others as well. What you're doing is allowing the mind and body to do what they're designed to do. We're working with the body as opposed to fighting against the body. And we transcend the tumultuous aspect of our lives to experience the quiet that rests below. Great book, by the way. If others haven't read it, Strength and Stillness, Bob Roth does a wonderful job presenting information regarding the transcendental meditation technique. I think it's one of my favorite books, personally. It's a good book. Yeah, it is amazing. Um, I, so talk a little bit more about that twice a day discipline, because I think it's it's probably one of the most important thing. You can't just do TM whenever you feel like it and skip it for a week and then do it for a day, right? right? There, there's something about that, making it part of your day that makes it more effective the rest of the day. Absolutely, it's part of your routine. I often say to people, anything at which you're really good, you only came to be so because of practice. Again, going back to Anders Erickson, deliberate practice. Transcendental meditation is very structured in the sense that you practice it twice per day. You're training your brain. Remember, it is the brain that creates the connections based on the experience. Those connections over time strengthen. Those strengthened connections inform your default thinking and default way of acting. Again, every action is preceded by a thought. And so what you're doing with transcendental meditation, by folding it into your day, you practice once in the morning, that 20 minute meditation sets the stage for your day. You find that equanimity that you're experiencing within the morning meditation is brought with you into your day. You find yourself tackling your proverbial to-do list with ease. You find yourself reorganizing your day in a way that's much more efficient. Similarly so with the afternoon meditation. The afternoon meditation, we've gathered mental fatigue throughout the day. Uh, best research says about 70 billion connections we create per day in our brain. All of those connections need not be retained. In short, everything that you see, you hear, you smell, you taste, you touch, and yes, you even sense creates a connection within your brain. And so what you're doing with transcendental meditation, when you sort of practice the technique, like when you fall asleep at night, you undergo structured forgetting. When you practice TM, something very similar happens. This is why when you come out of meditation in the afternoon, you have more mental energy. Mental energy translates into physical energy. You've allowed those connections that are not meant to have a long-term impact to unravel. Think of it as if your phone begins to malfunction or your laptop begins to malfunction. What is the first thing that we do? We do a hard reset. Transcendental meditation is a very similar process. You're doing a hard reset on your brain, giving your brain an opportunity to refresh itself, so much so that you have that added energy for the remainder of your day. Once Maharshi, he said, do less and accomplish more. And I'd been thinking about that phrase for a number of years, and I finally rested upon the idea that what he's suggesting is that we do less by taking the 20 minutes twice per day to practice the technique and we accomplish more. 
we accomplish more because we have the added calmness and clarity to move through our day to navigate it much more successfully. The way this happens is you're training your brain. You have this commitment to your own inner well-being and you fold this into your day. And I've had people will say, well, I can't find 20 minutes twice per day to practice the technique. And I said, well, you know what it feels like to have a really good night of sleep? And yes. You know what it feels like to not have a really good night of sleep? Absolutely. Think of this as being less about time management and more about energy management. You're managing your energy as you begin the day and as you complete your day. Morning meditation sets the stage for the day. The afternoon meditation, again, allows us that mental fog that we experience about three, four, five o'clock to lift. And in lifting, we have the added energy for our day. Speaking personally, before today's session, I sat to meditate. I sat to meditate. I've been working all morning. I'm working on my dissertation. I'm working with our children. And you've got a lot going on as you navigate things, but you sit to practice the technique. You come out so incredibly refreshed. It's like you had a really full on great night of sleep. You come out and you tackle the remainder of your day and you have that clarity that everything that you do at that point is really imbued with that clarity because you're cultivating it within. And it can't but be any other way. Why? Because you're practicing it within a meditation. You're strengthening those connections associated with transcending and calmness and clarity, and it can't but be brought with you into your day. It's just a part of the process. Again, every action is preceded by a thought. You know, it's so interesting because I'm, I'm remembering now, I went to a session at, at MIT mm -hmm. uh, led by a couple of grad students who said, the first thing they said was, you're all gonna tell me I don't have time to meditate. I need to sleep. You know, if I'm only getting five or six hours of sleep, how could I possibly stay up 20 more minutes and meditate? And they said, 20 minutes of meditation is worth two hours of sleep. And I don't know scientifically what that means, but what I'm hearing you say is in that 24 hours, if you take 40 minutes of that to meditate, you'll get so much more out of the waking and the sleeping time. It sounds like it's more restful sleep and more uh, focused, productive awake time. Absolutely. You find yourself getting better nights of sleep. I, we, there have been many people who have come through to learn tea with my wife and I who suffer from chronic insomnia. And often when we have a person who is experiencing chronic insomnia, we're excited because we know what's going to happen. That first night, they'll fall asleep after that twice meditation, that evening and then that morning, you know, they'll fall asleep and they will find themselves getting really good nights of sleep. The course is over three days in terms of learning TM, total of four days, the day you learn, and then three days thereafter. But what we find is that people are getting better nights of sleep. What you're doing is you're training your brain. You're training your brain to experience calmness. You're training your brain to go beyond all the stuff that often keeps us up at night that causes us to experience the insomnia. It's not just a physical thing, but it's also mental as well. And so getting that opportunity to transcend all of that, it sets the stage for a better night of sleep. But again, productive. I often say you've got 20 minutes twice per day is 40 minutes. You might as well say 45 minutes. 23 hours, 15 minutes for the remainder of your day. That 23 hours and 15 minutes would be so productive. Even your sleep will be productive because you get quality sleep, quality rest that affords you the opportunity to wake and become much more productive. You practice the technique. You have that calmness and clarity that's being cultivated. Remember, it is your brain. My dissertation advisor, I, I once asked him about the brain, he's a neuroscientist. And he says to me that we know about as much about the brain today as you knew about the heart in the 15th century. Think about that for a second. We're still learning about the brain. We understand neuroplasticity. We recognize that if we don't use this, this device, this three pound gray mass here, we will lose it. And the reality is you want to constantly exercise your mind Everything is a function of mind, everything. Social structures, the vehicles we drive, the apparatus we're using to connect right now, all this began as an idea within someone's mind. So when you sit to practice transcendental meditation, what you're doing is you're training your brain to experience calmness. You're training your brain to be centered when needed. You're training your brain to be focused when needed. You're training your brain to do what it is designed to do, to work with you as opposed to you working against the brain. Great. Now, I see there's a lot of questions coming in the chat. And first, I'm going to start with Dr. Bilchik, because you had a question, Brian. You want to? Sure. Yeah, had a comment. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to have you uh, talk about things that we don't always talk about, but we recognize the importance. You know, we've always recognized the mind-body 
heart connection mm -hmm. and um it's it's been something we've we've spoken about in, uh, in the past as well you know uh, you you talk about this being a tool and one really has to practice this so that when you need it most it's accessible to you and um this is something that you know we've had a heck of a year i mean we all have mm -hmm. had you know this crazy year and and i think uh, stress is at a, a, its highest level and i think when we feel so stressed that we don't know what to do and we can't necessarily reach this tool this this meditative state where it's actually beneficial i think when one has to uh, i'd love you to address at the time of stress how do you kind of get into this um uh, more readily. And then the other, uh, before I let you answer that, I just wanted to make a comment. I um, recently saw a patient of mine uh, who was suffering from a lot of palpitations and arrhythmia. And we have this device where we monitor their rhythms and their heart rhythms, and we can do it on a real time basis. And there was all through the day, there was a lot of this arrhythmia. And then for 30 minutes during the day, there was nothing, just normal sinus rhythm without ectopy or extra systoles. And I was like, I wonder what this person is doing when the heart is actually slowed down and has absolutely no irrit ir irritability. And uh, this pattern kind of emerged day to day. There was this period where there was no arrhythmia. And, um, you know, I reached out to my patient and said, what are you doing between 5.30 and 6 p.m.? Because it's the only time during the day that you're having absolutely no arrhythmia. And it was, the answer was clear, uh, you know, I was meditating. Mm -hmm. And it was stunning to me because there was this practical kind of sense of, um, and, and for me, scientist medicine and this reality of seeing what the benefit was to the heart of no arrhythmia. I really mean it, like not one extra systole, whereas there was this tremendous burden throughout the day. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Belichick. I think often people, the beautiful part about this technique is it can be easily quantified in, in terms of its efficacy. And that's one of the beautiful things, into, I think, in terms of TM, that we have now the scientific devices to actually quantify what the ancients have told us literally for thousands of years. And thank you for sharing that story. And it's, it's something I think often people don't think about, but it is something that definitely happens. And it happens because you're turning your attention within, you're allowing the mind to do what it's designed to do. And allowing the mind to do what it's designed to do is a settled, you allow the body to do what it is designed to do. Now to your question, in terms of how do you access this calming clarity, this inducing moment within the midst of stress, it's a default behavior. Anyone who practices a form of martial arts will tell you that you, I was it Bruce Lee says, I don't fear the person who's practiced, you know, 10,000 kicks one time. I fear the person who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. It goes back to your brain. When you practice transcendental meditation, what you're doing is you're training your brain. You're training your brain to experience the calmness and clarity that is resident within you. It isn't resident just within some, it's resident within everyone. We are biologically predisposed to have this experience of calmness, but we often forget about it because we have things coming at us every moment of every day that has become our default way of being. But in truth, when you cultivate this calmness and this clarity by practicing the technique, it comes to serve as a default way of being. You think of it as you, begin to plant different seeds within your mind, create different connections within your mind that are associated with calmness. And in the moment of stress, it will be there for you. It's like making, you have a Vanguard account. You, you constantly drop money to your Vanguard account and you don't take a look at it. It's automatically just there, you know, every week, every month, every quarter is just there and you get a quarterly statement. And oh, it's, it's increased this much. Oh, it's increased that much. In a stress-inducing moment, it's like the best Vanguard account because all of a sudden, you need it, it's right there. The calmness and clarity becomes your mainstay. Why? Because those connections within the brain have been created and over time strengthened. So that's how you access it. It happens as Maharshi would say spontaneously because you cultivate, you've done the work as Goethe said in the quiet places, in your home, in your vehicle, on the T as you sit to commute. 
you cultivate that and when you need it most is always there. Excellent question though, thank you very much. Wow, so I'm gonna start asking some questions from the chat and people please feel free to add more questions. But there's a couple of questions, whether this is different, TM is different than mindfulness meditation, Vipassana meditation, all the different kinds of meditation out there. Can you describe how they differ? Excellent question. Excellent question. There are, to date, there are three broad categories. Every meditation that has been peer reviewed falls into one of three categories. The first category is classified as focused attention. Focused attention, you can think of that as like a Zen meditation. Uh, for example, you have a candle placed on your desk. You give your attention to the candle. Your mind wanders. You bring your attention back to the candle. You focus, 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 mind wanders. You bring your attention back to the candle. Center primarily within your prefrontal cortex, you're producing what's called gamma, the CEO of your brain. 30 to 50 cycles, very high amplitude in terms of the brainwave pattern because you're focusing your attention on the candle itself. It could also be you have a white piece of paper with a dot in the center, you give your attention to it, your mind wanders, you bring your attention back. That category, focus attention, again, is like a Zen meditation. The second category is classified as open monitoring. Open monitoring would be like a mindfulness technique. If any of your patients have ever used the app Headspace, Calm. If you have ever sought to, when engage in a conversation with someone to make eye contact, to listen to them, to really understand what it is they're saying versus waiting to <laughs> respond, to get an edge in it. You really listen to the person. You're being mindful of how you chew your food. You're mindful as you walk along the street, how your foot hits the pavement. You're mindful of your body in space. You're mindful of your heart rate. You're mindful of your thoughts. Within your brain, this is producing theta. It's a slower frequency than gamma, but still on the instance of focused attention and open monitoring, you're engaged in the mind at a very active level. The third category, this category where in which TM falls is classified as automatic self-transcending. You're automatically transcending the self, meaning the lowercase s self, the, the thoughts that populate your mind, the, the can'ts, the shan'ts, the never wills, you begin to transcend all of that, those failed expectations, those failed moments in life. You begin to transcend all of that. The thoughts associated with those experiences, you transcend them. And in transcending them, you experience the calmness and clarity that's native within everyone. And in experiencing that, you're experiencing what is classified as restful alertness. This is alpha one, eight to 10 cycles per second in terms of EEG. Alpha is associated with cortical idling, but alpha one is restful alertness. You are simultaneously rested within the meditation, but you're also very alert, meaning you may have a moment within the meditation. You hear sounds off in the distance, yet you remain unfazed by them. You remain unfazed by them because you're within the meditation. You're very settled. You're very relaxed. You're very calm. You're very centered in that moment. Everything that's happening out there is happening out there for this 20 minutes. Remember, the first word in the word meditation is me. It's an opportunity for me to give myself this time. It may be the only one or two times per day that I get an opportunity to do so. And in so doing, you strengthen those connections and repeatedly practicing transcendental meditation, you're strengthening those connections. And it's going to default way, really becoming a default way of being within the world. Again, focus attention like a Zen meditation. Open monitoring would be like a mindfulness technique. Automatic self-transcending is a category where in which TM falls. And again, you're automatically transcending the self because you're thinking the mantra. You're not chanting because chanting is an external thing. You're thinking the mantra as you would your favorite poem, your favorite song lyric, your favorite person's name. You're seated comfortably, you're thinking the mantra. And in thinking the mantra, being seated comfortably, the mind settles. You transcend. And it's in that transcending, however long it lasts, you experience that quietude Without all the stuff that's going on out there and in here, you experience that native quietude. And for many people, that's a very startling experience because it's the first time they've ever had such an experience. They've always thought their mind was constantly active. I've had so many people, my wife and I come to us and say, I can't meditate because my mind is too active. And I often just smile. I say, your mind has the capacity to be at rest as well. And so I look forward to working with you and every single time when they learn TM, their mind settles and they say, I reached some quietude, I didn't know that was there. Or I feel like I did when I was five or six or 10. You're taking them back to a much more innocent time. Society forces us to be particular ways in the world. 
to, to do certain things in the world. And if we were to ever have a conversation with our seven or our 10 year old selves, it would say, you know, what have you done? <laughs> Why have you forgotten this? This is when you were fun. This is when you enjoyed life. It doesn't mean you can't be the go-getter as you regularly practice team. No, it does mean you can do that. Look at Ray Dalio, look at others. But at the end of the day, you turn your attention within, you bring more and more of that which is within you, the quietude into your day. That is how we really are. That is how we become much more successful because everything is a function of our ideas. Our presentation of self is a function of what's going on within here. <laughs> everything is a function of mind. Once you allow the mind to settle, the body is going to settle. The body will normalize itself. And thank you, Dr. Dolce, for sharing that story because I don't think people really understand the efficacy of the technique. And when you sit to practice the meditation, you will see what it does to the body, what it does for your mind, what it does for your life. So thank you for sharing that story. Thank you. But it doesn't happen right away, does it? Right? No. I mean, it, it's practicing the way an athlete practices no. becomes muscle memory and it becomes that's why it comes automatically when you've done it enough that even in a crisis, you don't have to consciously say, ah, my mantra, you're not doing that. No, not at all. You, you, you've cultivated that calmness and clarity over time. And, I, and the one way that I think about it, you have a dye, a vat of dye, and you dip this white cloth into this yellow dye. You hang it in the sun, it dries, a bit of the dye remains. With repeated dipping and dryings, that cloth over time becomes saturated with that dye and it will not fade no matter what you do. When you sit to practice team, something very similar is happening. You're allowing your mind to do what it is designed to do, to experience the calmness. It's designed to be, to, be back, to be active, but also to be at rest as well. And so what you're doing is you're cultivating that capacity that's native to you. So much so that in that stressful moment, it's just there. You don't have to think about it martial artists, musicians, you don't have to think about playing once you play Shostakovich a thousand times. <laughs> it's just there for you. My, life, my wife and I, we listen to a lot of Yuja Wang on the piano and she's just a brilliant pianist. And, or Yo-Yo or -Yo Ma or Mike Block is a wonderful cellist here in the metropolitan area. And so you listen to them play and the effortlessness with which they play tells you they've practiced their craft. When you practice transcendental meditation as instructed, you are going to have an effortless life. Maharshi, page 100 of his book titled Science of Being and Art of Living, he says, quote, practicing transcendental meditation allows one to make full use of one's surroundings. I know when I read it the first time, full use of one's surroundings, I was a bit incredulous at first <laughs> because you're trying to feel, well, I can't make full use of my surroundings. But yes, you can. And the reason you make full use of your surroundings because you bring your full self to every endeavor, your full, calm, centered self. You navigate life much more successfully, much more efficiently. It comes because you cultivated the calmness and you bring it with you into your day. It works. Now, I think some people naturally gravitate towards, say, baking bread, playing golf, going for a walk, do those physical activities, exercising, can that count or be a place where you meditate or it really has to be sitting in a quiet place? That would be a different type of meditation. With TM, you're, sit you're seated comfortably to practice the technique. If you're walking about, that would be like a mindfulness technique because you're in activity. But with TM, what you're doing is you're allowing the mind to settle and then allowing the mind to settle, the body settles as well. That's where you, in terms of Dr. Vilchik was saying between that, it was a six or 6.35, 5.30, 6 o'clock, that period where you know, the heart was functioning normally. The body does what it's designed to do. We give the body what, it's requ what it requires, it does what it is designed to do. And, and how do people who practice TM feel about mindfulness? Is this like us versus them or you embrace all types? I don't know. For me, my wife and I, we eschew hyperbole. We often say to people, look, every meditation has its value. My dissertation advisor, He's been working with people from the Esalen Institute, researchers, to understand the different qualities in, in each meditation, to understand what's happening, how it's happening. And if you want to, they're probably 10 or 15, maybe 20 years away from this now, such that if you want to have a specific experience within your life, you practice a particular technique. With transcendental meditation, it just does something different within the brain. In short, every area of the brain 
becomes enlivened. Whereas with mindfulness, it's certain areas of the brain within focus attention, different areas of the brain. But with transcendental meditation, it enlivens the entire brain itself. So it's not just one part of the brain, it's the entire brain. And this has been shown repeatedly with, uh, for example, many people will have what are called functional holes within their brains. You won't, we don't really have holes in our brains, although my dad at about 13 would have disagreed with that. <laughs> but what you find is those areas of the brain that are dormant, they begin to enliven. This gets into neuroplasticity. All of a sudden, those areas that fire together, wire together. And you're bringing that to bear. You're bringing those areas of the brain that have normally been inactive, bringing them online, making them much more active. I, I know people who practice and use uh, Sudoku, uh, the game to, to, again, allow the brain to have a level of activity. What you're doing with TM is something very similar. You're allowing the brain to do what it's designed to do. Every area of the brain becomes illumined. And this gets into, again, EEG, fMRI. Mm -hmm. You see it repeatedly in terms of the research consistently. So such an interesting um, issue of, you know, needing to be still and focus. And, um, you know, Martin Samuels, who was uh, the chief of neurology, uh, you know, when people used to talk about uh, their mind and their memory and cognitive function worsening as they aged, he, uh, and then they were trying to do all these, uh, you know, mind uh, exercises and Sudoku and all these kinds of things. And basically he would say that what you really need is to get quiet and allow the brain to refresh and to recharge because what you have is what we call benign senescent forgetfulness. And the more you try make that change by doing stuff, um, the worse it got. And so cognitive function might decline. And we're living in a world now where there is so much electronic stimulation. Yes. And so I think that, you know, uh, we, we talk about the pandemic and the, uh, the assault that we've all had mm -hmm. emotionally uh, over the last year. And then we've reached to electronic, uh, you know, uh, stimulation to kind of keep us going. And, and this has happened through the, you know, I look at my, uh, you know, friends, kids or younger kids and, and nephews who are kind of addicted now to these video games. And that's the way they're kind of getting their uh, distraction out. And I think there's, there's too much uh, electronic stimulation for all of us. We really need to have that quiet time. So I love the idea of that discipline of saying, you can't do anything else while you're doing this to do it effectively. Exactly. You actually have to focus to do it. And, and we give our patients so much uh, instruction as to you need to exercise, you need to eat healthfully, you need to do this and that. And, and sometimes you, you just have to tell people you actually just have to stop mm -hmm. and, and stop it all, quieten the noise and actually uh, focus in on the things that actually do make a difference. And I know there's a lot of data and scientific data mm -hmm. to show the decrease in inflammatory markers and the, the cytokines and all the kinds of things that lead to vascular disease, lead to, uh, you know, um, cancer and inflammation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we know that the science is out there. And I think that people think of, uh, you know, uh, all kind of uh, meditation as, as voodoo and, and, and it really is not. And there's a lot of science behind it. I feel somewhat jealous myself that I'm not at that point where I can actually spend 20 minutes and get to a, a, a place of stillness. And I think, uh, you know, after listening to you, I'm, I'm kind of re-motivated to get to that point. I practiced martial arts my whole life and, and that ability to meditate before and after. And the, you, know, you, you already spoke to that. So for me personally, I really appreciate uh, the talk that you've given. And I know that so many people have so many questions about it, but it's been uh, a real eye-opener for myself. I feel uh, refreshed just listening to you. Well, I, I will tell you, it would be an honor to work with you. And I would love the conversation after you've learned TM to note the differences in terms of your perspective on pre and post, because I, I know when I came to it, you know, there was a level of incredulity because I'd left the graduate program after two and a half years and only to later learn that within some of the professor's offices were the journals in which some of the articles were published on transcendental meditation. And at that point I realized as Thomas Kuhn talks about in the structure, or scientific revolutions, it's a different paradigm. It's a different way of thinking about possibility. 
I often say that we go from, as a result of practicing TM, this idea of something being impossible to I'm possible. It's a subtle shift in perspective. And that subtle shift in perspective comes as a result of direct experience. And then having that direct experience of calmness and clarity, and then bringing it with you into your day, it then becoming your constant companion, your life just rounds out in ways you can't even imagine. And so should you choose to learn TM, let's just say I look forward to those conversations. You would not be the first physician with whom I've had these conversations subsequent to them learning. So it should be fun. I'm gonna bring out a question from the, the chat here. It says, each experience is unique. However, isn't it typical of our minds to group experiences, perhaps especially negative ones? Mm -hmm. This tendency makes it more likely to go over negative experiences. How does TM address this? Think of it this way. You've introduced the mantra into the milieu of thoughts, which is your mind. You're going to encounter thoughts. Over the course of the three days after you learn TM, you undergo this process of understanding the technique of the, the, the trans, of transcendental meditation, what's happening, why it's happening. But as it relates to thoughts, what to do about the different qualities of thoughts as they surface within your mind. If you walk into a fun house, you're going to encounter all the things in the fun house. If you walk into a house of horrors, you're going to encounter all the things in the house of horrors. So your mind is a very similar space because of all the experiences that you've had and the creation of the connections that you've done over your lifetime. So thoughts may come up, but what you'll find is that there were thoughts associated with an experience that happened you know, some time ago. It never really had a hold over you. We've given it more time in our mind. My dad would say that given it free rent in our minds and he was in real estate and he would never give you free rent. <laughs> so you're giving it free rent in your mind and that is then impacting your life as you move forward. It's not to minimize, downplay, to belittle the mental experiences. It just highlights how we have the capacity within us to transcend. It is resident within everyone. And transcendental meditation is that technique along with the mantra that facilitates the process so when you encounter those thoughts associated with prior experiences, you're transcending them. You come to have a different relationship with them. You realize, that, oh, I can let this go. And it's in letting it go that you find your center, you cultivate that strength, and that comes to serve as your calling card as you move throughout your day in your life. Someone's asking, can, can I learn this virtually? Can I learn it on, oh, virtually, so like one-on-one -on -one with an instructor? Mm -hmm. And someone else is asking, can I do this online by myself? Do I need to take a class? So you'll download the app to your phone, be it an iPhone or an Android device. You download the app to your phone. And at that point, each day, the knowledge will build upon itself. So for example, the first day after you learn the technique itself, that's in person, masks and gloves. We use social distancing as well. That first day after you've learned the technique within the app itself, at that point, you're discussing really... <laughs> the correctness of the practice to make sure that you're practicing TM correctly. The following day, you've practiced twice more, you're dis discussing the cycle of meditation, but also to the experiences one may have when practicing TM. That third day, again, twice more practicing on your own, you're discussing within the app itself what's happening outside the meditation. How is it that you're getting better nights of sleep so quickly? How is it you have more energy, more calmness, more clarity? How is it that this has occurred so quickly within the meditation? Plus two, what is it that you can look forward to as a result of long-term practice of TM? So over the course of those four days, you have the virtual aspect again for those three days, but the day of instruction, that's the day it's in person, lasting about an hour. Each of those days within the app, we recommend allocating about an hour to make your way through the material. But alongside that, you also have your three days of Zoom group meditations, facilitated via Zoom, of course. And the idea there is to serve as a touch point to make sure that you're making your way through the material within the app itself successfully, to make sure that you're practicing the technique correctly, to give you this foundation, a solid foundation at the outset, to again, give you the solid foundation at the outset so you have the best experience possible in the shortest amount of time. This goes back to your point earlier, Dara, how long does it take? The brain is designed to settle, the body is designed to settle. You're facilitating the process of practicing as instructed and allow it to be what it's going to be. Some people will have Overnight anxiety decreases. We had this happen many times. People high blood pressure numbers decrease. Low blood pressure numbers normalize. PTS symptoms begin to abate. Chronic anxiety, crippling anxiety begins to abate. It happens because you're practicing the technique. But what you're doing is you're training your brain. And again, as with anything that you do that's, that you've done so many times at which you're really good, it simply required practice. 
Transcendental meditation requires practice, but you experience the calmness rather quickly. The effects of that calmness over time, those experiences accrue and come to serve as your default way of being within the world. Now, for people who are thinking about doing this, mm -hmm. um, we're going to include your contact information. So you're at the Cambridge Center for Transcendental Meditation. Yes, we're here in Cambridge and we serve the entire metropolitan area from the North Shore all the way down to the South Shore. Our office is just here in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And you offer an introductory free session for people who just want to hear a little more about it, which is something Absolutely. I did. Yes. And yes. so interesting, you know, on that group, I think there were 11 of us. There was an airline pilot, mm -hmm. there was a college student who wanted to come off her anxiety meds. You know, there's a spectrum of people who have very different reasons for coming and exploring this. Mm -hmm. um, but if somebody is interested in, in knowing more, I would recommend that introductory session that's free. And we'll have all the links that people can sign up to do that as well. Excellent. It's all via Zoom. Again, it's, it's a great experience. And my wife and I, we love what we do. We get an opportunity to work with people and have them have the best experience possible. That was our computer going off. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, clearly you love what you do and you're passionate. And maybe we can end. You were going to tell us the story of how you met your wife and oh, your family. Yes. I learned TM 25 April 2008. I'd flown from Atlanta to Fairfield, Iowa, Maharshi International University to learn Transcendental Meditation as part of the David Lynch weekend. So I'd flown there, was there for the full four days because it's four consecutive days. I was there for five days. And I flew back to Atlanta and I was initially wasn't to resume graduate school until the fall of 2009. I'm sitting in a coffee shop in Atlanta and my mom and says, why don't you move up your date of admission to the fall of this year? And I said, well, debating with myself as we all often do. And I said, no, I'm gonna do it. So I contacted the young lady uh, who's my uh, admissions counselor, Ela Zabe. And she was kind enough to answer my questions, what was involved. She said, well, just let me know. I said, well, consider yourself notified. I'd like to move up my date of admission. The moment I made that decision, she enters my application changes the date, they fast track everything. I go through the process. I learned that I'd been admitted to the graduate program to resume graduate school 29 July, one day before my birthday, which is 2008. I'd gone in the dining hall and got there in the middle of August. And from August to one December, so Monday, 2008, after Thanksgiving weekend, I'd walk in the dining hall and I had my book under my arm, my tray in my hand, and it just felt different. I'd been going to the dining hall every day from the middle of August until that day, and it never felt what I felt that day in the dining hall. I'm like, it was so strong, so palpable. I had to stop. I stop and I'm looking around, what is this feeling? And I look over, I can see her in my mind's eye right now. West side of the dining hall, second bank of windows, seated at a two person table by herself. The sun's coming in and she's eating her food. And I said, oh, it's you. And I know how it sounds, and I know how it would have sounded to me before if someone had said this to me, but it happened to me. And I migrated from the east side of the dining hall with my colleagues in my graduate program to the west side with a group of guys. And I sat there, one of whom, <laughs> Marco, he says, Bruti, why are you sitting over here? Normally you sit over there with the other guys. You took me in class. I said, oh, no particular reason. I just wanted to hang out over here. And I just sat there, and I'm like, who is this woman? Who is she? That was Monday. I didn't walk up to her until Thursday to introduce myself. She says uh, she's there, to, you know, studying for the advanced techniques. I said, "Oh, great! I'll, you know, I'll see you." She said, "Yeah, I'll see you sometime in the evenings." That was a you know kind of brush off. I know how to take a hint. No problem. I go back undeterred. Friday, tray in hand, book under arm. Is this seat taken? And she says, "No." I sat down. We had a conversation. And as they say, the rest is history. We were wed uh, 2010, 7 11, 2010. And this year makes 11 years we've been married. We have three small children, seven. Our son Emerson will be four in July. Our newest son, Tennyson Blake, was born uh, six, five weeks ago now. Five weeks ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Since, since we spoke. <laughs> since we spoke, yeah. So we have three small children, Chloe Rose, Emerson James Warren, and Tennyson Blake. And, you know, I, it, it, my life rounded out in ways, my life was pretty cool before I learned TM, but it became even better once I learned TM. And 
I know what it sounds like when you hear these things from people. And I know if you go online and you hear the interviews from various people discussing their experiences, I know what it sounds like. You'll ask yourself, can I have that experience? And my answer, my wife's answer is a resounding yes. Yes, you can. You can have a better life. You can have a clear mind. You can walk through your day with much more centeredness and bring that with you into your life to greater and greater effect. It is your birthright. There isn't a person alive who can hear what it is that I'm saying. They cannot practice TM at the very least being the age of 10 and have similar results. It just requires practice. Again, anything at which you're good requires practice. Transcendental meditation is no different. That's my truncated story. Thank you for asking the question, Dara. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, and I want to thank everyone in the audience. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. There's wonderful questions in here. And um, this was fantastic. So for those of you who are interested in learning more, we'll send out an email, and we'll have all your contact information. Uh, say hello to your wife and kids. Can't wait to meet Will them. Will <laughs> And uh, have a wonderful, sunny day. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic. Thank you for the invitation, Dara. Thank you. Thank Bye you now. so much.